Good morning again. Is it working? Is it working now? Can you hear me? I feel powerful suddenly. All right, must be on. Well, good to see you guys. Um, some of you have no clue who I am because this place is popping all the time. Um, my name's Peyton, and me and another guy named Charlie, who is launching a church in Whittier tonight, uh, we uh, kind of were here back in the crazy days where we went out into Bixby Park. Some of you were with us. And we decided to uh, do church in a community hall, which uh, we eventually got kicked out of. And we started doing an open air in the park, and we kind of found out that people just walking around the park you know, have no desire to go to church, uh, no interest in God whatsoever, walked around and uh, just said, you know, someone's talking about God, and they mentioned you too, or, you know, how does that go together? Or the guy talked about Rage Against the Machine, or the X-Men, you know, that sounds kind of different than the church grandma took me to. And so they started coming over and, uh, you know, people got saved and um, it's been a fun little ride. So anyways, I'm here almost as like a guest. Uh, you'll see me every so often pop my face in like Sean Connery in a bad B flick. I'll keep turning up. So, uh, well, you know, he's kind of had his day, hadn't he? All right. So open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We've started the book of Romans, so uh, we're going to read starting with verse 8. We started last week, so if you're kind of new here and you're like, hey man, I don't even know where that is in the Bible. You've come to the right church. Okay, we always say this is a church for people who don't go to church. So you might want to kind of look over the shoulder of the person next to you. They're probably nice. Uh, just say, hey, can I borrow your Bible with you? Can you share with me? And uh, it's the book of Romans if you have a Bible. Um, can't tell you what page it's on, but, uh, you know, look in the index. That might help you out. Book of Romans, starting with verse 8. Paul's writing a letter to a group of people that live in a city, you might have heard of it, called Rome. Supposedly all roads at once led there. You can still go there today. So this letter is to the Romans, people who lived in Rome, and Paul himself had never been there. So I want you to understand that he's writing to people he's never met before. But at the very end of the book, he starts saying, hey, say hey to so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. All roads did lead to Rome. A lot of people that Paul knew, and Paul, by the way, was a missionary. His job was to go all throughout what we now know as Turkey and uh, tell people about Jesus who had never heard of him before first-timers, right? I mean, most of you went to Sunday school or you had some knowledge of God. Uh, when I was in Europe, I uh, spent 12 years as a church planner. There were people literally there had never heard uh, about Jesus. They did a, a survey once and they said, what happens on Easter? And adults now were writing things like, Easter is the day. And I was in a, in a uh, uh, post-industrial community with 70, 60 to 70% unemployment, mostly blue-collar blue steel town. If you ever seen Blade Runner, some of that was filmed in Port Talbot, Wales. If you Google pollution um, on the images, uh, Port Talbot is one of the places that usually comes up. Uh, it, it was in my niece's textbook when I was there ministering. But anyways, so people in the local paper, they were interviewed and asked what happened on Easter. And they wrote things like... Um, on Easter, the groundhog comes out, and if he sees Jesus and his head opens up and fire shoots out, I'm not making this one up. That was the actual, these are the kinds of responses that they had no clue. It was like this big jumble of stuff about Jesus. So Paul is writing to Rome, but the gospel has already gotten there. But Paul can't wait to get there, because when Paul gets there, it's game on, right? He's going to preach there, and he says, I can't wait. And, he, and the pastor we're going to read, he says, I can't wait because I want to see a harvest there. I, I want to see people really coming to God. So we're going to read what Paul writes to people he's never met about, hey, guys, I'm coming. You ready? First, verse 8, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit and the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I could impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, we might mutually be encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. 
I want you to know, brothers, that I've often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Gentiles, by the way, simply meant non-Jews, okay? And if you're just like, hey, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of like culturally, you know, um, weird to say that. Understand, he's gonna flip it around now in the next verse because to, to the Romans, right? The Romans were like the height of prestige. Their culture was like, they were civilized and sophisticated. They saw themselves as, hey man, this is where it's happening, Right? Rome is where it's at, right? If you're not part of Rome, you're kind of like a country bumpkin. You're backwards, right? And so they called everyone else who didn't speak their language, the Greek language, they called them barbarians, right? So Paul is going to now say that the Jews are like barbarians, right, to them. He flips it around. Everybody has their prejudices. That's what he's saying. But Paul is saying, I'm going to everybody because God doesn't have these same distinctions, right? Right? To God, these distinctions don't even exist. So what he goes on to say, and, and I don't know if he's being tongue-in-cheek or if he's just showing them, maybe Paul was ahead of his time and he's zooming the lens back to give a panoramic scope of humanity and just kind of laughing at humanity, how they're all kind of, they think they're better than everyone else, right? Like you're in America, right? Do you ever like listen to America? Oh man, we're Americans, we're the best on the planet, man. You know, so glad I don't live over there. Right, And then you go to the Europeans, and they watch us on TV and go, oh, Americans, oh my gosh, only in America, right? Everybody thinks their tribe or their place is better, just like the playoffs today, right? Everybody knows the other team are just idiots, right? That's what's going on here. So Paul says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. We all got our ideas about who those people are, right? So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. He's not telling them which category they're in. He's just saying, we're all the same, man. He goes on, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you because we are not talking today about a belief. We're not talking about a country club that somebody joins or a social movement. We are talking about you. We're talking about the power that you alone possess to grab hold of a soul and to change it, to get inside of it, to transform it from the inside out. And you alone have that power. Lord, I don't have that power up here. Nobody walking around today has that power. You alone have the power to go into the deepest part of my soul and to change me, seemingly sometimes against my own will. Father, we pray this morning that you would do that, that we would find ourselves falling into your hands, almost powerless against your power, aware of your presence. Lord, even as we sing that song, that music this morning, Lord, it wasn't the music. We had to turn it down because a cop showed up last week. Lord, it, there was something spiritually moving in our midst this morning, Lord. My heart wanted to sing. I wanted to blow a vocal cord on some of those words, Lord, because they're my story. They're exactly what happened to me. Father, we pray today that everybody sitting here today would know that all of those divisions that humanity puts up, all of those borders that people erect and say, you can't cross over this. I pray, Lord, you would blow them all away today. That is everyone's creator, everybody's creator, here this morning, that they would hear you speaking to the soul that you made. And they would know that this good news, this gospel is for them. And that you would work powerfully in their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. You're all going to court. You ready? Everybody like getting called up for jury duty? Who likes jury duty? 
Anybody? Yeah, because you can read books in jury duty, right? And play like Mad Libs and all that. But the reality is jury duty sucks, right? It's no secret. You're like, oh, man, you know, like suddenly you get it and you're like, oh, I had plans. I was going on vacation. I had a, you know, I had a job I like or I'm taking this class. Nope, all that's out the window. Sometimes you get taken to court and, and you're not on trial. You're not the guy like going to court, but you got to go and watch court, right? You know what I'm saying? It's a different thing than like watching Judge Judy on TV when you got a remote. No, you're going to be there for months, all right? And sometimes in life, we get dragged to court against our will. This is what's about to happen. Paul is about to write to people that are self-righteous. And any self-righteous people here today? Any? Yeah. Now, the fact that you didn't raise your hand kind of tells me you're probably self-righteous. Not me! I'm not self-righteous. Those guys probably are, but not me. Right? I mean... All right. I mean, you only got to go on Facebook and we're also stinking on social media, right? We all got this opinion, right? I mean, in an age of tolerance and an age of like, don't judge me and it's my, you know, we're so dang pedantic and judgmental. I never really, I mean, I, I just thought it was me. And then I get on Facebook and I'm like, no, it's pretty much everybody. Everybody's got an opinion and everybody thinks they're right and everyone's slamming everyone else, right? Watch any news channel and they're all smart and everyone else is an idiot. Paul's getting ready to take us to court. And we're about to cross-examine. That happens in life. Life cross-examines us. Life drags us into court, sometimes against our will. And we begin to have accusation against accusation. We begin to all of a sudden realize, maybe I'm not as all together as I thought I was. None of us is. I hope that you've realized by now you don't have it as together as you think you do. I don't. If, you've, if, if you come here as kind of like a mess and, and a broken person, you're in a good place. This is kind of the church for people like you. The difference is we may realize we're people like you, right? Paul's going to use words like condemnation, which are legal terms. Justification, which means your pardon, <clears throat> you're declared innocent. In talk terms like righteousness, meaning I've done no wrong. Um, he's going to use all kinds of, you know, he's going to talk about punishment and talk about all kinds of things. And these are things that in our minds and our hearts of hearts we think about, but only a little bit. You know those topics that we think about, but only a little bit. Like if you're of working age, taxes, Right? Um, you might throw zombie apocalypse in there because, you know, you know it's going to happen, but you just, you know, you try to push it out of your mind. You know, have a shotgun ready and retractable stairs, but because they can't go upstairs. You know what I'm saying? You got like certain things. Death. Death is something we try not to think. I mean, one out of one people dies. How much time do you spend thinking about death? A lot? You guys are morbid. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's not bad. I mean, you don't want to like obsess about it, but like, we have certain things, or the, uh, Freud called them defense mechanisms. We, we don't want to think about it, you know, get out of my head. That's a stupid thought, you know. I don't want to think about that. We do that, right? You know, then instead you're thinking about like puppies and rainbows and unicorns and all the stuff <laughs> that makes you happy. Oh, man, Roscoe's chicken and waffles. That's the best. I don't want to think about death. I want to think about Roscoe's, right? That's how we are. We do that. And Freud called it a defense mechanism. You see, we have our defenses, another legal term. And Paul's going to take us through, and he's going to declare to us, nobody gets off, man. Nobody is innocent before God. Because it's one thing for the newspapers, one thing for the magazine, it's one thing for the talk show hosts, it's one thing for the news. It doesn't matter what popular opinion is and what your friends think. At the end of the day, what matters is what God thinks. And that's what we're coming into in Romans. You see, you've been to church and you've heard before, you know, have you accepted Jesus? And that becomes, have you accepted? You need to accept Jesus. Have you accepted Jesus? Romans turns that around and it asks the question, has Jesus accepted you? That's really where the rubber meets the road. Does God accept you? And Paul uses his turn here. The good news. 
The good news in Jesus Christ, the gospel is that yes, God will accept any and all who come to him through Jesus Christ. And so we're going to get into this this morning and talk about um, kind of where Paul's at and where he's coming from. Now, Chris has given me a big, you know, Chris is kind of, he's, he's breaking down the passages here. Chris doesn't know me too well because he knows, he doesn't know that when I get into an epistle, I like to take every little verse apart. So I got to behave this morning because I'm looking at the clock now. So you ready? Buckle your seatbelts. Kansas is going bye-bye for a little bit. I'm not going to be long, I promise. We're going to have to go fast. You ready? Paul starts off and he writes the intro bit, right? Always in the beginning of a letter, Paul always says, hey, how are you? I'm Paul. This is what I want to say to you. And he has a few greetings, little personal remarks. So he starts off by saying, I really, really thank God for all of you. The reason why, remember, Paul hadn't been there. <coughs> The reason why is because Paul hadn't been there yet, but the gospel had. And Paul is thrilled about that. Paul's thrilled that in a sense, he's this guy, he's like this messenger, like this mailman, telling people the good news of Jesus. You know when you get a good news in the mail, right? Like, what was the last, anyone have any good news in the mail recently? Anyone? Yeah? What was it? Stuff around Christmas. Stuff around Christmas, yeah. Family letters, yeah, good news, so-and-so had a baby, and oh, here's a Starbucks gift card, and you're like, which one's cooler, the baby or the Starbucks gift card? I don't know, but they're both good news, right? So you get good news in the mail, you get bad news in the mail, right? Bad news. I got one, check this out, I, I get sent this bill from the DMV that says I owe like $350 on a car that's not mine. I don't even know what this license plate is, that's bad news. When the DMV thinks you owe them 350 bucks, and you're like, what car is this? You know, it's Christmas time. What car is this? You know, I don't know what they're talking about. You know, this was not a good Christmas present because it happened to come right about the same time. Good news. Paul's delivering the mail. And what Paul is more stoked about is it's almost like God doesn't need mailmen. He says, your faith is going throughout the whole world. I mean, all roads did lead to Rome. And people were moving in the ancient world back and forth a lot under the Roman Empire. The Romans built roads. You can still go today to Britain. When the Romans built roads, they were like straight, man. So you could be in like Scotland or Wales or somewhere. <coughs> Excuse me. And late at night, the teens would take their cars and they would you know, go really, really fast up a hill and then down because these roads are so straight, they don't. Switch back like ours do to get a gradual gradient and decline on it. No, it's and they would bottom out and sparks would fly and woohoo, you know, because the Roman roads were straight as an arrow. Well, Paul realizes that this is what's happened with all these people, the Romans building all these roads. This is like the superhighway of the gospel. And now suddenly travel was opened up in the, in the ancient world and Paul wasn't needed. It was just normal people, yourself, 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 just, you know, like here I am, I'm a knucklehead up here preaching, right? Um, you know, the only people that are hearing me are right here. And maybe the guys living over there that are currently considering getting another apartment. <laughs> but then there's you guys. You guys go out from here. Now imagine how many people in a week if God is doing a work in your life, how excited you are, and it just comes out, you go into work tomorrow morning, they're like, oh man, you know, I went to, on the weekend, I went to the river, and blah, 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 and they're talking about, what'd you do? And you're like, man, tell you what, I heard the best news yesterday I ever heard in my life. Boom. Everything I've ever done that would normally drag me to hell, and they may not even believe in hell. That's a great conversation to have. But you just say, everything I've ever done in my life, forgiven by God. Boom. Wiped out. Wipe clean, start over. And the good news is not just for me. This was happening, this chain reaction of people's lives being transformed, so much so that the gospel had spread all the way to Rome. Paul hadn't been there. It was just spreading organically, naturally. Now, that's how Christianity was designed. Let me tell you something. Christianity was never meant to be a big business. Christianity was never meant to be an institution. Christianity was never meant to be married with government or politics. In fact, when Christianity stops being this natural, organic thing 
that's almost kind of viral, just one, each one reach one, when it becomes this machine, it becomes this corruption of what it originally was. It starts to rot and to fester and to decay. Hey, I know Christianity. Let's make it like the official legal religion. You all have to believe it. And then let's get an army together. Yeah. And then we'll go attack other countries that don't believe in Christianity. And we'll make them. And someone went, yeah. That's a great idea. <coughs> the more institutionalized we become, the farther away from Jesus we get. I'm, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the Calvary Chapel movement. Um, didn't grow up in it, but I got saved in it. And this is back in like 1987, right? I'm 40 years old now, so I was like 14 then. And it was cool because Calvary Chapel was such a weird thing. The pastors, they, they were what was called blue jean preachers. They, 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 they were just hippies, like ex-hippies, man. They just stopped doing LSD, found Jesus, and became preachers. And it was cool. Like, you know, just someone would start a church in their living room and boom, it just happened. And they'd be like, how'd you start this? Church? I don't know, man. I just started teaching the Bible and, you know, people started coming and we're here. And then we became like this machine. Like now the mega church is this big business. It's us. I, I, every once in a while I ask people, I go, do you remember when Calvary Chapel was really cool? Like when people thought you were a cult, you know? <laughs> That's what they thought of the early church, man. Like, you guys are weird. Like, you actually believe this Jesus stuff. And yeah, we meet in a school or a park. Or, but it's pretty cool, you know. God's there. And, you know, now we're so refined. And we're like, you know, okay, 9 o'clock. You know, got to hurry up, man. Get out of here by 10 because we got another one coming in 30 minutes, you know. People in the parking lot. You know, you know it's like this drive-through religion. Big bit, and I'm not knocking, it sounds like I am, but I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, it's so cool when Christianity just spreads naturally, right? Just someone goes, hey, I'm going to have a Bible study in my house, and boom. If, if you go here, we don't discourage that, because we don't have a problem. If you want to get together and read the Bible, it's not like we got to put our Pope hats on and, no, we must shut this down, we must control it. It's not the Middle Ages, you know, the Bible's not in Latin anymore. It's not locked in a cupboard. You don't have to be a priest. This is what Paul was rejoicing in, that what Paul wanted in his ministry was to see every single person be empowered. The gospel is about empowering people. The gospel is about liberating people. The gospel is about taking each person and having each person realize you are a part of this. God, when he transforms you, wants to use you to transform other people. And it spread in the early church like wildfire because it was not a structured thing. It was a move of the spirit and it caught the first century world ablaze. Does that make sense? Paul says, I remember. And, and by the way, that's kind of what we're going to talk about. Notice how when he says, Paul doesn't put himself on a special elevated status. He says, when I come to you, verse 11, he says, I long to see you that I might impart some spiritual gift to you. Now, that would almost sound kind of, um, you know, like, I am the mighty missionary pastor and I'm coming to you and I'm going to give you something that's going to change your life. You know, kind of like Dragon Ball Z, you know, you know, and you're like, you know, and Paul doesn't do that. Paul, Paul doesn't step back and go, you know, wait till I put these babies on you. You know, Paul stands back and says that we both might encourage one another through our mutual faith, you to me and me to you. Paul doesn't see himself. He sees his calling as unique. Hey, I, and I'm on the road a lot. I plant churches. I start them up and I move on. It's kind of like me. But you get the sense that the leaders in Christianity, unlike what Dan Brown says, never elevated themselves. They just saw themselves really, probably more than anything is, is, else as is the biggest sinners, right? Or like, hey, 
Paul goes, I'm the chief of sinners. That's probably why God's using me because I need more grace than probably the rest of you guys. And after all, this is a message of grace. And so I become an embodiment of the gospel, this good news, that God's grace is for everybody. So people hear me preach and they go, oh man, that guy used to kill Christians. Well, if God can save that dude, surely he could save me. Paul didn't see himself as anything special, nor did any of the leaders. I think we've gotten away from that, right? Like one of the reasons you sit around tables is because this is each one being used of the Holy Spirit to speak into another person's life, right? That, that's what it is. It's, it's not like, you know, like I come up here and I share my thing and it's like, now hear my gift and then boom, it's done. You hear my gift and that's it. We go to church and it's one dude's gift. That would suck, right? I mean, you got to hear and suffer through my gift a little bit, but when I'm done, the discussion begins. Let me tell you how it happens. As God works in you, you're able to pour something out into somebody else's life. Paul says, that's what's going to happen. This is going to be an interactive thing. I'm no one special, Paul's saying. We're going to interact with each other, and God's going to use each one of us to change. There's a saying that says, life change doesn't happen in rows. It happens in circles. Right? You ever been to AA? Ever knows how AA doesn't sit in rows? Because they know, they understand what the scripture is talking about. AA, by the way, was based on Christianity. Dr. Bob was a born-again Christian, and he started up. He just took it out of the churches because he thought, well, you know, if we do it only in church and do it as a Christian thing, no one will come. So he did that. If you walk through the 12 steps, I know a lot of preachers bash on it. It is the gospel. Worked out. First thing, admit you got a problem, right? First thing you have to do is admit you're a sinner. Then acknowledge a higher power, okay? Realize you cannot save yourself. I mean, I could just parallel each of the 12 steps, right? for you and outline the gospel. It was Dr. Bob, who was a doctor and a minister. They came up with it together. Here's the deal. They realized that when you put people in circles and you have them talk about what this quote unquote higher power is doing in their life, um, it's called testimony. It's really powerful stuff. God's done in my life, and my life, and my life, and my life, and your life, and your life, and your life. And it's like a sprinkler, you know? It's like having 12 sprinklers, you know? You know, turn on each other. It's gonna get pretty saturated, right? It's powerful stuff. It's from the church, or at least what the church was originally meant to be. They started these groups, and they realized we can't have people sit in rows and have their lives change. That's like an audience. That's like a show. And Paul gives this kind of idea here that, Going to church ought not be a spectator sport, but a participatory sport where you use your gifts. Case in point, the other day, um, because I do not have it all together. If you've been here for any length of time, you know, um, I'm I'm pretty free with the confession. So you want to hear one? My my wife's always like, careful, you know, don't tell them all the junk. This isn't even even like a fraction of the junk in my life, right? (coughs) Here's the deal. I need Jesus still. A couple weeks ago, right before Christmas, kid was cutting across three lanes in a sports car. I got a five-month-old baby. I got a five-year-old, and I got my wife. The one night in a long time, my wife says, let me drive. Let me tell you, glad she was driving because she saved our life. Guy cut across three lanes, hit us at 80 miles an hour, almost hit us completely off the freeway by Avery Parkway on the five. You know you go down an embankment, right? You don't really come back from that one. Um, There's no guardrails there. We get hit so hard, he knocks us, not just past the divider onto the off-ramp, but past the off-ramp into the narrow margin between us and the embankment. It's starting to narrow now, so that's better, but okay. A little bit shook up, you know, whatever. A few days later, I'm riding in the car with Liberty and the baby had to drop my wife off at the body shop. Her friend came and picked her up. They went to go see a movie. I'm driving home. Do, 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 Mr. Pastor Man driving in his car. Do, 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 do. And some guy comes up the side of me and goes right near my nose. Now, I'm super protective of my kids. I'm really protective over my five-month-old. She can't breathe. She has major scar tissue and inflammation in her lungs. I'm giving her a breathing training. She's in and out of the hospital all the time. So... The fact that someone did this, it was like something got pushed. My buttons got pushed. And Papa Bear came out. And I mean, Papa Bear came out in a really bad way. Like, 
pop, let's put it this way. We're at the, we're at the streetlight. At that moment, I ceased to be a pastor. I could even go so far as to say, at that moment, I ceased to be a father because I forgot my kids were there. Luckily, they did not learn any new vocabulary words. Liberty asked me, Daddy, what did that mean? And when she said it back, it, I can't even tell you what it was. You'll figure out. But I ceased not only to be a pastor and maybe a father, but probably a Christian at that moment. You know what I'm saying? Because what came out of my mouth, I rolled down the window. First, I'm trying to be cool about it. My adrenaline spiked, and I look over, and I say, excuse me. And this was not a great Poupon conversation we're about to have. I was holding everything back. It was like, excuse me. Is there a reason you cut me off back there like that? And he goes, yeah, man. Don't go the same speed as everybody else. Now, <clears throat> he's a punk kid. He's in his 20s. Now he's showing my... You know, mom and dad probably paid for that. Tra- you know, all my prejudices and all my junk going through my mind, you know. You spoiled, you know, rich kid, blah, blah, blah. So I'm there, and I'm in my car, and, and I say, look, you know, uh, you know, man, I, I was doing like 10 miles over the speed limit with everybody else. You know, I'm 40. I'm trying to reason with him. And he goes, and he said something. I don't even remember what it was. All I remember, the next thing I remember, I'm yelling. I'm taking my seatbelt off and I'm almost crawling across the car. I am screaming, come on, you know? I'm, 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 in, I'm in fight mode now. Hulk smash mode would be what it was, yeah? <laughs> now, I'm ashamed of, you know, I'm telling you this because I'm a dude, I'm, I'm, I'm a real guy, okay? Don't wanna ever want you to think. But I have to tell you, I'm not proud of that. I went and told Andrew, and my wife started crying when I told her. She knows what I came from, she knows my background, she knows the rage that over the years would consume me. And she started crying. And then I'm like, oh no. And she's like, and Libby was in the car. And I'm like, yeah. And, and she just kept crying. I'm like, oh, I've screwed up so bad. And so it's bothering me. I'm praying. And I'm going, Lord, I don't want to go back there. I don't want to be that dude. Lord, I thought we were a lot further down the line than that. And God's like, no, not as far as you think, pal. And then a couple, now, uh, this is where I'm going. Remember the mutual edification? Stay with me, Johnny. Stay with me. Don't leave me. Get there. My wife, a couple days later, right? And I'm talking to God. I'm going, God, just, you know, Lord, there's obviously still just this crud in me that sometimes I think is dealt with and it's not. And my wife goes, hey, I want to tell you a story. And it, it, she wasn't gunning for me. It was just, she just happened, hey, I heard this really cool story. And it was about this lady who was in Starbucks. And she was going into the drive through in Starbucks. And she was getting ready to go through the drive through Some lady honked at her, flipped her off, and zipped in front of her in line. You ever had that happen? <laughs> Hulk smash mode, maybe? What's your response? A. <laughs> B. Andrew says... I heard her on the radio and she said, what I did, she said, I was so upset, but she said, I saw the look on the woman's face and she looked harried. I mean, she looked, she had a bunch of kids in the car, you know, she looked like, you know, she was just going through a nightmare of a day. She said, so when I'm behind her and she's already ordered a drink, I get up to the window and I say, "Um, I'll have such and such and I'm paying for the woman's drink in front of me. So my wife is sharing this to me. And I go, oh, that's a, that's a really cool story. <laughs> like two mornings later, I'm praying. And I'm praying about, you know, Hulk smash. And the Lord is just dealing with me. Like just talking to me. You know, all the, all the, the arguments you see, everyone bashing other people and different people. Dude, I got enough of my own junk, right? Like, I don't, if you ever notice my face, I don't get into that stuff. I don't get into the fray because I got enough junk this guy's dealing with. You know what I'm saying? Jesus got a full-time job on this guy, okay? He's like my one-to-one. And I'm praying and the Lord's dealing with me and I, I just, I go, Lord, um, that story the other day, and the Lord's just speaking to me. 
Every single time from now on, someone does that to you, you're going to go out of your way to either buy them something or bless them or turn around and say, man, I'm sorry, how can I help you today? Jesus is like, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And God's telling me all these things. I'm too stupid to figure out. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, Lord, how come it's so hard for me? Why is it so hard? I've been a Christian all these years. Why are these things still recurring and coming up? Now, I'm not kind of like that old saying, I'm not what I would or what I should be. I'm not what I could be. But by the grace of God, I ain't what I used to be. Well, we've come a long way. But it was like Jesus said to me, you know what? Remember that verse? And I just felt like it was open heart surgery. The Lord goes, that verse in the scripture that says, therefore, do good to your enemies. And I'm like, oh, so lady at Starbucks didn't invent that? Because I thought that was really clever. And the Lord's like, no, Peyton, you've been a, you've been a Christian 26 years. And that verse has been there the whole time. And you read it a million times. You just haven't been paying attention. A lady on Starbucks, she ain't got nothing on me. She was one of his followers, but the Lord's like, that was just her living it out. And I'm staggered because I'm like, <coughs> this lady at Starbucks has no idea what she just did in my life. I needed her in my life. And then I needed my wife to come and minister to me and tell me the story, not realizing how much she was ministering to my heart. Do, do you realize that's how the Holy Spirit works? Each one of you in here, you're needed. You're needed. God doesn't need you. The people around you need you. That's where Paul goes, you know what? I really want to depart and go be with Christ. Like I could die today, Paul says, and I really want, I really want to go be with him, right? I got a round trip ticket to heaven. Most people only get a one way, but Paul was like, I've been there. Can't wait to go back. But you know what? Some of you need me. I realize that. That's what Paul was saying. But I need you too. Makes sense. The power of that, when a Christian realizes that th there's no clergy. Do you know what that means? The clergy means like you pay somebody to, to do the job. What the Bible teaches is that we all have callings that are just different. Chris labors in the word and doctrine, but you have a calling that's equally valid. I have a calling to go plant churches, but you have a calling that's equally valid. And the Holy Spirit uses you more powerfully than you know if given a chance. Why do you think the devil's always working so hard to keep you feeling like crap? You wake up in the morning, you just feel like crap. I just feel like crap, man. I'm a bad Christian. I'm this. And Satan's like, can't use you then, can we? And he turns to the other demons and he goes, I got him. Right? That's what the enemy's doing all the time. Trying to make, and Paul is excited to get to them and to share this with them. And he says, and I am obligated to preach this good news to everybody. Why is he obligated? Because if God could set him free, then he could set anyone. Paul was a guy who was liberated. He was liberated from his sin. He was liberated from his guilt. He was liberated from condemnation. He was liberated from all. And he says, I have an obligation now to go back and free the others. And he goes on and he mentions in this passage, he says, first, I think my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is, oh, excuse me, sorry. He goes on, he says, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. <clears throat> Paul says, I'm not ashamed. Interesting that, isn't it? I'm not ashamed. Um, there's a lot of things that we could be ashamed about, but Paul's not talking about a sin here. He's talking about going to a bunch of sophisticated people like the Romans. He says, I'm not ashamed to go and proclaim this to you, this power at work. What I shared with you today, it's not like once, you know, God dropped a nuclear bomb in my life and that was all I ever needed and boom, and now I'm perfect. This power goes on working. You see, the, when, when Paul goes on, he says, for this is the gospel. He says, for 
The gospel is the power of God for salvation. That word power there, he's telling you, the gospel, this good news, is something that happens to you. It's not just something you believe. And when he goes on to say that a righteousness from God is revealed by faith, he doesn't mean a belief. You know what a belief is, right? I believe that. I believe the sun will come up tomorrow. That's, you know, that's passive. Faith is something that happens to you. One day, like Paul, you're bent, like Paul was on the road to Damascus, ready to kill people. And the next moment, the Holy Spirit breaks in and you, you, you have this encounter with Jesus. You don't know how you know, but it's this confidence. The Bible defines faith as a confidence in things. Like, it's something that comes upon you. It is a spiritual insight. It is not belief. Do not believe that it is belief. Faith is a power at work within somebody, somebody who was powerless to do anything. And the, the, the way that Paul capsulates it here, just so you know, these verses right here, verse 16 and 17, <coughs> this is the rest of the book. Paul's gonna unpack verse 16 and 17. Such a powerful little uh, passage. Martin Luther, y'all heard of him? Famous reformer, um, guy who uh, was kind of like the, the, the Protestant Reformation, the, the figurehead for that. He was a Catholic monk. And every single day, he agonized over how he could be good enough for God. And he couldn't do it. He made a pilgrimage to Rome. He climbed the famous steps there on his hands and knees till they were bloody. He gave as much money as he could. He had been a lawyer. He had been caught in a lightning storm. The lightning terrified him. Not because he was all, you know, you peasant, super. He was a lawyer. He was an educated man. And lightning struck right next to him and completely exploded the tree. Splinters flew, embedded him, and he cried out. And he didn't cry out to God. He said, Saint Anne, <laughs> if you deliver me, Saint Anne, I swear I'll become a monk. And he joined a monastery. Well, because he was so flippin' smart. He became a professor of divinity, and he started uh, lecturing on uh, Paul and uh, Romans and the New Testament, and somebody once asked him if he loved God. Now, he was an expert in the law. He was an expert in uh, uh, many of the things, uh, Catholic theology, and when he was asked if he loved God, he said, love God? Sometimes I hate him, and the reason he hated God was because he felt that God was so righteous and his laws were so hard that Paul would never ever, or Martin Luther would never ever be good enough. He was a monk and he was trying his darndest. And when he got to the Old Testament, he understood all those laws. And when he got to the New Testament, he realized that if I try to be as good as the New Testament talks about, on top of that, I'll never get to God. And of course, he didn't understand that the good news, what he says here, and he came to these verses, by the way. In his preparation, he was in his class getting ready to teach, and he couldn't figure out this verse. It says, for in the gospel, a righteousness of God or from God is revealed. The righteousness of God is revealed. He's like, well, I know the righteousness of God. It's impossible. And suddenly, the power of faith, boom, came to him. He had a spiritual insight. It's not talking about the righteousness God has in himself. It's talking about the righteousness God would give me. If it's a righteousness and a holiness and moral absolute perfection that God has, I'm screwed. That's why I hate God. He's impossible. But the gospel is that God loves you so much. Yes, he's holy. He's perfect. If I were to ask you today, do you consider yourself kind of good people? And you're like, yeah, we were self-righteous. Remember we didn't raise our hands? I go, cool. What we're going to do today is we're going to take a bunch of rapists and pedophiles 
and murders of women and children, and we're going to group them all in your living room, and we're going to have lunch. Sound good? You'd be like, no, no, no way, not in my house. Uh Uh-uh. No, 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 no. Not that filth in my house, right? Y'all, y'all would, because you got standards. God is holy. He's righteous. He loves us, but in order to be righteous, he can't just wink at sin and go, don't worry about it. I know, you know, you didn't, you didn't mean it. Don't worry. Yeah, everyone makes mistakes. That's not what the Bible says. Just like you have your standards, God says, you know what? I'm righteous. I got standards. And I made you, and I love you, and I want you to be with me, but you've done things, and you are a certain way. That's what the Bible teaches. We're about to go to court. We're about to find out if what God says about us is true. You see, you're going to find things written in this book, but what's going to happen is as we go through it, you're probably going to see them written in your heart as well. And if you're not a Christian, you're going to start saying, that seems impossible to come to God. But from the beginning, Paul lays out Jesus. And he says, if you will put your trust not in what you can do to earn acceptance with God, but if you'll put your trust in what God did for you through Jesus, then you'll be saved. You see, we just celebrated Christmas. Christmas makes no sense apart from God's righteousness and holiness. It doesn't. Makes no sense. No, no need for Jesus to be born if God ain't righteous. Why did Jesus, why was Jesus born? God came in human form. Why? So he could take our punishment. So he could stand in our place. And there God would pour out all the wrath on him. When Paul says here, for the righteousness of God is revealed, the very next verse he goes on to say, for the wrath of God is already being revealed. The wrath of God. You just look around the world and you're like, man, I can see what happens when people don't follow God. I can see the the inherent consequences of a life without God. We see it. The world's full of it. But Paul says, but now God in his great love is revealing this good news. He's revealing a righteousness. He says, look, I know you've already screwed up. I know you've already messed up. My son came. He lived perfectly for you. He did what you couldn't do. And now he went to the cross at the end of his life and he dealt with your sin there. All the wrath and all the punishment I had for your sin, I heaped it on him. He came as a sacrifice, as your substitution, and I punished him so I would never, ever, ever have to punish you. And I can give you his righteousness. All guilt on him. All sin on him. All of my love, mercy, and forgiveness intended for him, now for you. All the wrath, guilt, and anger intended for you, now for him. Do you understand? That's good news. That means today, if you want to believe in him, that means not just believe in him, that means trust. That means throw everything on Jesus. That's what it means to become a Christian. That you see your own sin, but you see Jesus. I need him. He is my savior. He is my only hope for a relationship with God. He is my only hope for an eternity with God in heaven. That is something that only happens by faith, by the power of faith. And each and every one of you in here today that's following Jesus, that miracle has happened. And if you're here today and that's never happened, like it says in here, barbarian or Greek, foolish or wise, it doesn't matter who you are. Jesus said, whoever receives me, I will in no way, whoever comes to me, I will not turn them away. It doesn't matter who you are today. You can come to him. And that word trust, there was a missionary years ago went to South America. And he was trying to figure out how do I uh, tell uh, this tribe the word trust. They had no word for faith or trust. And so he was trying to tell them, look, uh, and they're like, how are we saved? And he's like, oh, 
It's like, it's, it's hard to explain. I'm, I'm looking for a word. And one night they were all in their hut and they used to sleep. It's in South America. They used to sleep on these bamboo poles with a hammock in between because they had like all kinds of nasty critters that want to eat them at night. So they would sleep in these hammocks. And he would watch, the men would climb. They were like as lithe as monkeys and they would like climb up these poles and fling their whole body into the hammock. You know, they would just almost like pole vaulters, like woo, you know, one solid move, boom, into the hammock. And he said to one of the natives one night, he's like, what's that word? Where you just fling yourself into the hammock, just full body, like everything you have, boom, into that hammock. He said, that's my word for faith. That's what you have to do with Jesus in order to be saved. It's like the old hymn says, nothing in my hands I bring, only to your cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Weary come to thee for rest. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, lest I die. Those old hymns say it best. You may not think they rock enough, but they rock enough, let me tell you. They rock in content. Those old hymns say it. Another of them says, rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. And he says, could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save me and thou alone. Sorry to get all King James on you. You must save me. That's what it means. When Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God that is the power that comes into your life. When you begin to see him as everything, as all you need, and you start to feel the love of God seeping in in places where you only had guilt, you only had pain, you only had shame, you only had, I want to run away and get as far away from this God thing as I, no more of this preaching, no more of this, and suddenly you start finding your walls crumbling and your heart breaking and softening. As Jesus is whispering to you, you are mine. I made you. I died for you. I bought you and I want you. I will do everything I can to get you. I will send knuckle-headed preachers at you. I will cause these loons to meet longs. I will do whatever, but I want you to come to me. I want you to be broken by the power of the gospel. And Paul says you're only in one of two categories. He says it's the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. You just haven't come far enough down the road yet to realize your need before God and how badly you need Jesus. But the second category of people, he says, he says, but it is the power of God to those that are being saved. I pray that you would know that power. And all you need to do this morning in order to know him is to just come to him as you are, just as you are. No prep work, no washing up, no cleaning yourself, no getting ready, no straightening your tie. You come to him as you are this morning. That's how he wants you, just as you are. And you come to him this morning and you say, Jesus, I don't even know where to begin. I just know I need you. I, I can't, I'm not even religious. I don't even know what you would want me to do in the first place. I just know that, I need forgiveness. And you ask Jesus to forgive you. You ask him to come into your life. You ask him to wash you clean, give you a brand new start. And the Bible says that he will. The Bible says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That means just praying to him and saying, Jesus, come in. Can you do that now? Pray with me. Just in your own heart and your own way, agree with me. Father, I, I come before you now. I know that I've sinned. I know that I've blown it. I know that I need you. I'm sorry, Lord. But even my being sorry doesn't do it, Lord. I need your power to cleanse me and to change me and to bring my soul from death to life, to make me a brand new creature, to give me a new start, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you would pour your life into my life. That I would be what the scripture calls born again. Start all over. Be given a second chance. And if necessary, a third and a fourth and a 516th and a 1,600,000,000, 700,000, 562nd chance. 
If that's what I need, Lord Jesus, because your blood flowed and it's enough to cover all my sin. And I trust you to forgive every ounce of it as I put my trust in you. We lift all these things up in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've done that today, you will find yourself like Paul when he says, I found myself wanting to come to you, but I was hindered. He was hindered because he was a servant of Jesus. He wasn't calling his own shots anymore. His life was in the grip of someone else. His life was being directed and guided. You will find God in your life directing you, guiding you. If you've done that this morning, I want you to come talk to me. Talk to any of the other ugly bald guys here. I think it's safe to say the only ugly bald guys are our leaders here. So it's... uh, You can come talk to one of us or maybe the person next to you. We're going to have a little bit of worship, one song, and then we're going to have a couple questions. 